Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship is discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level your path, the path for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Man does not live by bread alone. Thank you, Connie, for reading for us this morning and uh, using your gifts to bless our body. And I am, I was encouraged hearing that and knowing that we have a father who cares for us and he loves us. With that, why don't we, um, before we just jump in, ask God to bless our time and help us to hear his word and, and, and just receive it and believe it and obey it. Father, we recognize that these words are not just uh, the words that Connie read for us this morning from the book of Hebrews or what we're about to read in 1 Corinthians 5. Although it was written by a person, it was, God, your words that you inspired these words, that every single word is God-breathed. And so while we recognize there's a human author, we ultimately recognize there's you, Father. You are the true and ultimate author of Scripture, every word coming from you. And I pray that you would help us to believe it, to live by it, to rejoice in it. Help us, Father, to be a community where we treasure your word. And I see that evidence. We read your word outside of this time. And there are so many people here, I think of even when just a while back we were looking at the Chosen series and how David walked us through just different scriptures. And we got to, and he pointed our eyes to the scriptures. Father, there are different people here who continue to do that. And I, I'm thankful for that, Father. And I pray that that would increase even more here. We would love your word and we would seek to be centered around it, to be founded upon it. And it would be our sole authority for what we believe and how we're going to operate even as a church. In Christ's name, amen. So how many of you, you know, when you were a child, you heard your parents say something like this? And I'm just interested in, so show your hands. So when you were a child, you heard your parents say, clean your room. I thought everybody, right? Probably everybody heard that when they were a kid. Share your toys, another big one. Eat all your food. Yeah, maybe a little less. Uh, take your plates to the sink. All right. Uh, put away your shoes or clothes. Good. 
All right, last one. Take out the trash. <laughs> Frank over here, he put up both hands. So, <laughs> yeah, if you heard these things from your parents, it was because they were disciplining you in a good way. We often think of discipline in a negative sense. And I want to encourage us just through the message this morning. Maybe we can reframe that and, and just see that discipline isn't always just doesn't carry just a negative connotation. It means that they were trying to help you and shape you for the better. They kind of knew what was coming along down the path as parents do. And they said, hey, if we help shape you in this way, it's going to help you later on down the road. And they wanted you to mature. They wanted you to grow up. In Hebrews 12, 6, it says the Lord disciplines, the Lord disciplines the one he loves. So the reverse of that would be if he doesn't love you, then he doesn't discipline you. And, you know, he, he forsakes you, lets you do what you want. So discipline is not a bad thing. Rather, it's a good thing. And we read there in Hebrews that it's for our benefit that we're disciplined. Why? So that we can share his holiness. To be like God. And when we talk about discipline... Specifically, we're going to be talking about church discipline. When we speak of that, what we're talking about is holiness. And the picture of holiness is Jesus Christ. And so God wants us to grow up. Jesus is called our older brother. We are to grow up and be like our older brother. I'm sure many of you guys, when you were kids, maybe you had an older brother and you wanted to be like your older brother. I just had the privilege of going to Ron Whistler's funeral, and that was a worship service. Not of Ron, but of the God he served. And I heard many people say, including Stan, I want to, you know, I love my big brother. I wanted to always be like my big brother, you know. So we want to be like our big brother, Jesus. And that means holiness. We read in Hebrews 12 that without holiness, no one will see God. And what that basically means is that you can't get to heaven just by being a Christian in name only, by only saying words or just saying a prayer. So God saves us to transform us so that we would serve him and worship him and live a life of holiness. God is a loving Father, and He disciplines us for our benefit that we might become more and more like Him. Remember, Adam and Eve were created in God's image, and through the fall, that image was corrupted. Jesus Christ came to restore that image, that we might fill the earth with people that look like our Father in heaven. And we're continually being transformed in that way. Discipline seems painful, Hebrews says. At the time, (laughs) you don't like discipline. As a kid, not many kids enjoyed um, being sent to the room for time out. You know, some of you guys, your parents may have, in a good way, in a loving way, gave you a spanking. I'm sure you didn't enjoy that. You didn't, you didn't walk down in the morning and say, hey, dad, mom, could you give me a spanking? I just want to start off my day that way. Um, it doesn't happen. And so discipline, discipline seems painful at the time. But Hebrew says in due time, that training of discipline yields the p- peaceful fruit of righteousness. Discipline comes from God out of love, and it has a purpose. It's the discipline itself is not the end. The end is to make us holy like our Father. God uses it to make us spiritually fruitful, to cause us to be like fruitful trees. Instead of bearing apples, we bear spiritual fruit. That means we're gentle, 
Uh, we have fruit hanging off of our life, so to speak, of gentleness and peace and kindness and uh, speaking truth and love, bearing with one another in kindness. So since we are God's children and we're his family, we're to be like our father. We read that we are to imitate our father. So that means even when it comes to accountability, even when it comes to discipline, we are to imitate our father as a church. And we're going to see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So if you would, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to read verses 1 to 13. 1 Corinthians was written as what's called an occasional letter. And what that means is there were certain things happening within the Corinthian church, and they sent Paul a letter saying, here's what's going on in our church. We need guidance. What does the Lord have to say to us about certain areas, certain things that are going on within the church? We're going to read of one of the, one of the things that's happening within the church, and Paul says, here's what, the, here's what the Lord's will is in this situation. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to be reading from the NIV this morning. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that does not occur even among pagans. A man has his father's wife. And you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? Even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit, and I have already passed judgment on the one who did this, just as if I were present. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, Hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. I have written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I'm writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you to judge are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. This is a hard passage. We've been talking about a healthy church and habits of a healthy church. And I would say that a healthy church fosters accountability. It fosters a desire to love the Lord, to be holy and to serve him. And it has a hatred of sin. God has a hatred of sin. So his community should have that hatred of sin. And we want to be pure. We want to be like this unleavened bread that doesn't have any yeast in it. And what it takes is accountability. We foster accountability. Now, I want to say this before we go much further. 
1 Corinthians 5 represents an end point in this process, not a beginning point. And so what I mean is, not everybody that's caught in sin, your first step is you kick them out of the church. It takes a lot of wisdom. Now, there might be some cases, really, really, truly heinous cases that would involve such a thing. And you need a lot of wisdom to get there. But most cases, I would say, don't end up here or shouldn't. In Matthew 18, Jesus says that if a brother sins against you, you're to go to that brother and show him his fault. And if he sees his sin and he repents, awesome, you've won your brother over. I would say most times, church discipline, like, that happens. So this represents an ending point, not a beginning point, right? So we don't start here. We work with people. And Jesus, in Matthew 18, he says, like, if, he, if, he, if this brother doesn't listen to you, uh, take take another person with you or two other people with you and go talk to that person. And then if he doesn't listen to you then, even with like two or three of you, then take it before the church. And if he doesn't listen to the church and he doesn't repent, then you're to treat that person as a tax collector. You're not to treat them as a brother or sister in Christ anymore. But even there, Jesus is not saying they only get three strikes and they're out. Jesus is not trying to say it's just a three-step process. There could be many steps between those three steps of talking to this person. Jesus is just saying when you find somebody who's caught in sin, your goal is you want to see them restored. You want to see them repent. You want to see them turn back to God in faith. And because you love them as God loves them, you walk with them. You know, and so it's a process. What we find here in 1 Corinthians 5, this person who is uh, involved in sexual immorality, he's, he, it says here, a man has his father's wife. And the idea here is that he continues to do this. He continues in this pattern. So this person that Paul is saying should be expelled, removed from among you. This person, he is flagrant in his sin. He's not turning away. So not only is he flagrant toward church authority, but he's flagrant ultimately toward God's authority. So he just has, he, he has no problem putting church authority under his foot and crushing it and saying, I'm going to do what I want to do. This is a person whose heart is hard and just will not turn back. And you've tried to, and, and the church has tried to walk with this person through it. So we don't have all of the history beyond this. So this is, like I said, at the end point of the process. And one of the reasons why I said, hey, why don't we look at 1 Corinthians 5 versus Matthew 18 is I think that for many churches, they struggle just like the Corinthians did with this step. Because we're in a society that preaches to be very tolerant of whatever anybody's involved in. And because we truly do love the people that are here, we don't want to do this, but there comes a time where ultimately you have to say, this person, they have a high hand toward God and toward the church, toward authority. They're not listening. They're flagrant. They're just going to continue. And ultimately, we can no longer say, you belong to the family of God. Like we how can you belong to the family of God and you're basically saying, I'm going to live how I want to live. I don't care what Jesus has to say. I don't care about what scripture has to say. I don't care about what you guys have to say. I'm going to live however I want. How can we say to such a person, you know what? You really are a child of God. You really do belong to the family of God. The best thing to do for that person is to say as a community, 
based upon your actions, we, don't, we can't say as a community that we believe you're part of the family of God. And maybe that action will shake them up and cause them to be like, whoa, <laughs> this whole community that used to be my family that loves me just said, they don't know if I'm a Christian anymore. I belong to the family of God. I got to wake up. And hopefully that happens. And we see here, even in 1 Corinthians 5, that in verse 5, the goal is that his spirit would be saved on the day of the Lord. So even this action, removing him from the church, is ultimately about his soul being saved on the day of the Lord. When Jesus comes back again, that he would be with, this individual would be with the saints. So the goal of church discipline, the goal of help, of, of accountability, is not, is not to just, you know, rub a person's nose in sin and say, look what you did, how bad and how awful you are, how shameful you are. That's not the goal of church discipline. The goal of church discipline or accountability is to help restore a person, to bring them back into right fellowship with God and right fellowship with the church. That's always the goal, is the person's salvation. It's not humiliation. And it's not even condemnation, because there's only one person who can truly condemn another person, and that's Jesus Christ. So we are called to judge. That's what the Corinthian church was doing. But there's a difference between judging and condemning. So there's a big difference there. Only God can condemn, but we are called to judge the, in, the insiders, us. And this is what Paul is encouraging the church in First Corinthians or in Corinth to do here. So God designed the church to be holy, and one way that we pursue holiness is through accountability. A healthy church, as we said, fosters accountability. Teachers foster growth in the classroom for their students, right? They look for ways to specifically help students to grow. Uh, so, for example, they might strive in the classroom to incorporate more hands-on learning for kids to help those kids to truly learn and to kind of be able to click with what's, what's being taught. And so I think here we must think as leaders in a church body, how do we cultivate accountability? How do we cultivate discipline? So as we think about helping each other, what does that look like? How can we do that? And traditionally, discipline has been talked about in two ways, formative discipline and corrective discipline. Formative discipline is what's going on right now. Like I'm preaching and you're hearing the Word of God being taught, you're reading the Word of God, and it's forming you. And so a lot of people talk about, you know, preventative maintenance for a vehicle. This is formative discipline, you know. So when you're involved in a small group, you're in formative discipline. When you meet with a with a brother or sister in Christ at Panera and you have coffee and you pray together and you talk about what's going on in your life, that's formative discipline. So corrective discipline would be somebody, a brother or sister approach you and say, hey, I've, I've noticed something in your life, a habit, and I'm concerned. That would be corrective discipline. Or the elders might say, hey, we have some questions uh, and there are some concerns that we have. Would you be willing to meet and talk with us? That might be an example of corrective discipline. And so there's, you need both formative and corrective discipline, or both need it in the church. But here we see, you know, for the Corinthians, they had gotten to a point where they're, they're in a Greek culture that prizes knowledge, wisdom, and power. And they brought that into the church. So they had a pride 
we're Christians. Here's what we know. Here's our great wisdom. And then they were looking at their spiritual gifts, and they were saying, look at how powerful we are. And they were creating divisions and saying, hey, this person is my leader. They're smarter, they're better, they're more capable. And they were, they were creating divisions within the church. They were prideful, and this pride had led them to a tolerance. Like, in their society, sexual sin was tolerated. Like, sexual immorality, for the most part, was tolerated. Except, Paul says here that this guy had his father's wife, his stepmom, And even for the Greek culture, they were shocked by it. Even the outside culture was saying, this is wrong. And I just want to take a small point here. This is just a little side note. Is that they could have learned something from their culture. Like their culture was, had a more godly, holy standard than they did. And sometimes that's true. Sometimes the outside culture can speak truth back to the church and say, hey, you guys have crossed a standard, even for us. You know, they can call us back to pursue God's holiness. And so even, so the the Corinthians had become very tolerant. The Corinthian church had become very tolerant of this man. They become complacent. And it doesn't really tell us why they tolerated it. You know, maybe this guy, some people kind of hypothesize that maybe this guy was a rich member of the Corinthian church, and they didn't want to do this because if they kicked him out, that they would lose money, and they would, they would lose status. But it, it, it truly doesn't tell us why they tolerated it. All we read from this is that they did tolerate this sin. And I think for today, in our culture, there's a lot of tolerance, especially when it comes to sex and gender. And I would say that's kind of the age, our, the spirit of our age right now is, hey, like what a person decides to do in private with another person or whatever, it's none of our business, and just, like, if they, like, love is love, and, and tolerate it. And that can kind of seep in, especially if you have a new Christian that comes in. They can bring that culture in with them, but it can also, you know, I mean, for all of us here, we listen to the radio, to the news, we might watch television shows, and it can seep into even our views concerning sexuality. I think what's really interesting here is that there are boundaries. There are boundaries in Scripture about our sexuality when it comes to how we relate with other people. So Leviticus 18 verse 8, actually speaks to this direct command. Back in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 8, God says, you're not to have your father's wife. So, what's happening here is they knew God's word, and they're not putting this sexual ethic into practice. So, for me, it was just, it was, the key thought here is, We can't just do whatever we want, sexually speaking. There are boundaries which God has created. One thing to kind of note in 1 Corinthians 5, as we read this passage, look at who Paul's addressing. Is Paul addressing the individual in this passage? Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to the church. Paul could have, and and probably did, I mean, he, he says here that he's judged this person and they should remove him from the church. 
but he's speaking primarily to the church. What are you to do with this person? So what are we to do with people who flagrantly just flout and crush God's authority and, and what the church is trying to speak, calling that person to holiness? What should we do with such a person? And, I, and it seems like Galatians 6, one says, if you see a brother or a sister who's caught in sin, you who are mature should gently restore that person. Uh, and so what we should do is when we see people who are caught in sin, it's not to tolerate it and be like, well, you know, everybody's got issues, you know, or who am I to say anything? And you're right, like, if you were just going to approach it based on your authority, then who are you? But you're not. You're following what Scripture says here. And you go to the person, and that's where I think the word gently is used. You don't go to the person, you treat them roughly. Hey, what are you doing, you wicked sinner? Like, be like me. I'm completely righteous and holy. But you have a gentleness to you, a gentleness to your correction and helping this person to come back to God and to be restored, to walk with God again. And so you gently do it. You say, hey, I love you. I'm not perfect. I know I'm not. But here are some things that I see in your life, and, and it's kind of concerning to me. And do you see some of these things as well? You know, and, and you're trying to help this brother or sister turn back to God. The sin that was addressed, I mean, he was just continuing in it repeatedly again and again. And what Paul was saying is that they were prideful. He says, you were, you're prideful. You're prideful about where you think you are with God spiritually. You're prideful about how much you know. You're prideful about how wise you think you are. And you're prideful about how skilled you think you are, all of your skills and your gifts. And you have such pride in all of those things. This sin and the fact that you've been tolerating it as a community should have knocked that pride, should have sucked the wind out of those sails. It should have caused you to mourn. Jesus says this, he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So like, when, when, when sin's happening within the body, what should, what should be our reaction to it is that we, are, we mourn over that. We mourn over it. That somebody has been caught in sin. That someone, instead of following the path that's good and beautiful, instead of continuing to love Jesus and, and take in his mercies and be transformed, that now they've been caught and they've been brought down low. It should cause us to mourn. Mourn for that person. <clears throat> he says here to hand the person over to Satan. One of the reasons why I read this passage is because in your Bibles it might say hand over to Satan for the destruction of flesh. Like the destruction of flesh is kind of a confusing part. So the reason why I read from the NIV is that it says your, the sinful nature so that the sinful nature may be destroyed. Because sometimes we could think, well, is Paul saying that this person is going to be killed physically speaking? And Paul is saying that the example here is the prodigal son. This is the idea that's in mind here, is this person is sent out. Basically, like, you're not a, we can't, we can't in good conscience say that you're a member and that you belong to the body of Christ. You're outside the church now. And by being outside the church, you no longer have the Christian community and the Christian fellowship encouraging you. You no longer have them speaking truth in your life. And like the prodigal son, he goes away from the father he spends every nickel he has and finds himself in the mud, eating what the pigs are having. And he says, he comes to his senses, it says, 
and he returns back to his father. That's the idea here, that you're sending this prodigal out to hopefully you're praying that he ends up with the pigs and comes to his senses and returns back home and says, it, it was better. I realize now the path that I took and it, and it hurt me and I see how damaging it is. I, I feel so depressed. I feel so awful. I want to go back to the church. I want to go back to God's people. I want to go back to God. I want to have relationship with them again. And so they come to their senses and their soul is saved. So by continuing to tolerate it, by continuing with this person, what essentially we're doing as a community is allowing them to believe one thing, that they belong to God and that they're safe and secure when in reality they die and they end up apart from God forever. And so is that really truly loving to do that? I don't think so. We would, we would have to say no. We want to see this person with God and with all of his saints. In verses 6 through 8, Paul reminds them of, of two things. He talks, about the Paso- he talks about the feast of unleavened bread, and then he talks about the Passover. So with the feast of unleavened bread and the Passover, these two events were connected with one another. The feast of unleavened bread, imagine that as a Jewish person, to celebrate this festival and to get ready for the Passover, what you had to do was the mom and all the kids would go around the house and collect every single crumb, every single piece of dirt or anything that might contain yeast. And the idea was you're going to search your house from top to bottom and make sure there's no yeast at all in the house. You remove every particle of yeast and you throw it outside. And only after you've done that are you ready to celebrate the Passover. So Jewish people, in order to celebrate the Passover, the first step was we're going to remove the yeast. In the Bible, yeast represents sin. Most of the time, the idea is sin. And so the idea is purity, right? To pure, that, that to get ready to celebrate the Passover, to, get, to truly do that with sincerity and not hypocrisy, we're going to remove all the yeast, all of the sin symbolically from our life. We want to be completely pure to celebrate this Passover and to remember it. And one of the ways that we celebrate the Passover as a church body is through the Lord's Supper. So how is this, how's this man that's involved in sin and the church is tolerating it, they're continuing to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And it's not in sincerity, but hypocrisy. Because we're celebrating Jesus came, he died for me, he bled for me, he purified me, he made me right with God, and he saved me to make me his, to serve him. But yet we're coming to the Lord's Supper with sin in our life, and we're tolerating it as a community, and it's hypocrisy. And we need to clean out the yeast, clean out and become what we really are, which is unleavened bread. Christ has purified us and made us unleavened bread. We are called to judge those who claim to be in Christ and belong to the church. And notice that it's not those who are apart from Christ that we're to judge, but what we're called to do is judge the insiders. This was uh, particularly impactful for me because oftentimes we can kind of, it's easy to sit around and judge what's happening on the outside of the church. Like what's happening in our culture, what's happening politically, what's happening in our society at large, and to condemn them. 
I think this, this is reminiscent where, Paul, where Jesus says, before you go to your brother and point out his sin, you know, get the log out of your own eye. And I think this is the spirit of that. Like as a church, we ought to be concerned with the purity of what's going on inside of here and judging that more so than being concerned with what's happening on the outside and all the impurity that's outside of there and judging it. Because God's going to judge the outsiders. But Paul's saying, we got to judge ourselves. We have to hold each other accountable. We have to get rid of the yeast and be who we truly are. We have to speak truth to one another in love and gently restore each other. And, and that, that can be very difficult to do. It can be awkward. I'll tell you, like, I, as a pastor, it's like one of the most unpleasant parts about what I, what I have to do is there are times throughout the week or throughout the year where I have to, I know I have to speak truth and love and try to gently restore. And I'll tell you, it's like my stomach is in butterflies, you know? And there are times where it's just like I want to throw up because I just feel so anxious about it. Because I'm, anxi- I'm anxious because I'm worried. I, I, I love this person. I want our relationship to continue. And I get worried about what if, what if it doesn't? But I ultimately know that helping them, speaking truth and love, trying to gently restore them, and keeping myself open. Because once I do that, I'm opening myself up for them to say, well, you know what? I've seen some stuff in your life. So I got to be humble, and it goes both ways. But that's, that's you know, God is saying, if you want a healthy church, if you really want to mature, if you really want to grow, you have to pursue holiness, and you have to do it through accountability. You have to do it through discipline. That's a big way that it happens. And you can't see it as a negative thing, but as a positive thing. And pray for hearts that are humble, that are ready to repent and confess and to be restored. But maybe that doesn't happen. And then as a community, we have to say to that person, based upon what I'm seeing and based upon the fact that you're not turning back and we've pled with you, we prayed for you, we've come to you, we've talked about what's going on, We've asked, we've called you to turn back to God, and you're just refusing to do it. And we, we can't, you can't come up and celebrate the Lord's Supper. How can you do that? It's hypocrisy. We can't call you a brother and sister and just fellowship like everything is normal because you just have a high hand to God. You're completely refusing his authority and to obey him. It's not a, that's not a child of God. We want you to come back. But ultimately, sometimes we have to, we have to make that line. And, that, and that's a hard, a hard thing to do. But again, I, I want to encourage us, right? The idea of doing such a thing is not the person's humiliation. It's not to hurt them but rather that they would be saved and restored to God. Let's pray. Father, we know that this is, this is a hard text as we read it, and it takes a lot of wisdom, Father. We pray for, for wisdom as we uh, help one another pursue holiness, as we try to keep each other accountable. Father, would you show us um, how to do that just personally and, and, and to speak truth into each other's lives, to, to worship together, to confess sin with one another, to pray for one another, that that would form us and shape us. But God, if, if we do need correction, I pray for myself and I pray for each person here that we'd have a humility. We would be willing to repent and confess of sin. We'd be open. We wouldn't be foolish, but we'd be open to hearing truth and being corrected because we know it's, it's for our good. Just like you correct us, Father, for good and for our benefit. I pray that that would be our hearts 
as we pursue one another, that it wouldn't be that we're trying to set ourselves up on some throne and cast down condemnation, but rather we're really trying in a spirit of gentleness to see people restored to, to healthy relationship with you, Father, and healthy relationship with others, to loving you with all their heart, soul, and mind, and loving their neighbor as themselves. Father, we need your spirit. We can't do this on our own. We don't presume to. Father, please fill us with your spirit for this work. In Christ's name.